This is Land of Havila, Psalm 69. It's 36 verses, verse 1. For the chief musician, to the tune of Lilies by David, Save me, God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail looking for God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who want to cut me off, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. I have to restore what I didn't take away. Comment in the first four verses we just read, it's a psalm by David. He's distressed, or it could be he's putting himself in the shoes of someone else distressed. Either way, it's inspired. In verses 1 and 2, he's up to his neck in trouble and misery. The situation is beyond his control. He needs God to step in. In verse 3, it seems to David God is unresponsive. Quote, my eyes fail looking for God. It's a where are you God moment. In verse 4, those who hate him without a cause are more than the hairs of his head. According to Jesus in John 15, 25, this is a direct prophecy of him that his enemies hated him without a cause. They were as numerous as the hairs on his head, and they still are. To this day, he's hated without cause. Also, the line about eyes failing, looking for God applies to Jesus because he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew deep distresses and the appearance that God wasn't paying attention, the appearance that God was angry with him. Verse 5, God, you know my foolishness. My sins aren't hidden from you. Don't let those who wait for you be shamed through me, Lord Yahweh of armies. Don't let those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, God of Israel. Because for your sake I've borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children. For the zeal of your house consumes me. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and I fasted, that was to my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate talk about me. I'm the song of the drunkards. Comment. Some of verses 5 to 12 we just read certainly applies to Jesus, such as verse 9, the zeal of your house consumes me. When Jesus destroyed the marketplace at the temple, quote, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house consumes me, John 2:17. Verse 5 is the only part of the passage that doesn't apply to Jesus because in that verse David confessed sin and foolishness. But the rest of it very much, though there's no documentation of it, we'd be surprised if Jesus didn't pray verse 6, quote, Don't let those who wait for you be shamed through me, Lord Yahweh of armies. Don't let those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, God of Israel. Speaking of those who are saved, Isaiah said, You'll not be put to shame or humiliated to all eternity. Chapter 45, verse 17. And of course, there might be temporary shame. The apostles were flogged and rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name, Acts 5.21. But any shame we might suffer will be turned to honor, will be rewarded in the sight of all. The Father will reward you openly, Matthew 6.4. In verse 8, I become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children. That applies to Jesus as well. His brothers mocked him, John 7, 3 to 5. In verses 10 and 11, David wept and fasted to his reproach and wore sackcloth and became a byword. In other words, his enemies mocked him, mocked him that since he was in a distressful situation, it was proof that God was angry with him and wouldn't listen to him. David's response, verse 13, But as for me, my prayer is to you, Yahweh, in an acceptable time. God, in the abundance of your loving kindness, answer me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and don't let me sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Don't let the flood waters overwhelm me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Don't let the pit shut its mouth on me. Comment, deep water is a symbol for terror in the Bible, we might guess, because for the most part they didn't know how to swim. Nothing creates terror so predictably like throwing someone in deep water who doesn't know how to swim. In verse 14, don't let the deep swallow me up. Now still begging for relief, verse 16, answer me, Yahweh, for your loving kindness is good. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, turn to me. 
Don't hide your face from your servant, for I'm in distress. Answer me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Come at my adversaries are all before you, meaning you see my adversaries as well as I do. Verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart, and I'm full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Comment verses 19 and 20 are overtly prophetic of Jesus. He looked for comforters, for someone to take pity, but found none, even as disciples left and fled, Mark 14, 15. John was an exception, and his mother and some of the women who followed him from Galilee, they all stood close, but there was no one to speak up or step in and make any difference. And in verse 21, they gave me gall for my food and vinegar for my thirst, which is exactly what happened on the cross. Luke 23:36. Now for some imprecations against the enemies, verse 22. Let their table before them become a snare. May it become a retribution and a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see. Let their backs be continually bent. Pour out your indignation on them. Let the fierceness of your anger overtake them. Let their habitation be desolate. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom you've wounded. They tell of the sorrow of those whom you have hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Don't let them come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be written with the righteous. But I'm in pain and distress. Let your salvation, God, protect me. Comment, the imprecations aren't messianic because Jesus didn't curse his enemies. Quote, when he was cursed, he didn't curse back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, 1 Peter 2.23. Instead of praying as in verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of life, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, Luke 23, 34. This was in keeping with his commandment, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you, Matthew 5, 44. And he said, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you, Matthew 6:15. And the Lord's Prayer says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. So it's imperative for Christians, for our, our own salvation, that we forgive and release everyone for everything. Jesus served an example of it. Though he was without sin, he still prayed for the forgiveness of his enemies. We must conclude that the imprecations and curses in verses 22 to 28 we just read, directed at God's enemies, don't originate from man, not from righteous man anyway, but they're revelations of God's eternal judgment against them. It's an assurance to us that God himself will deal with his enemies. Therefore, it's not our job. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, Deuteronomy 32, 35 and Romans 12, 19. Now in the closing seven verses, rather than ending in any type of doubt or limbo, there's no reason as long as God is on his throne to feel as if the situation is in limbo. We should always take faith that he's on top of it. As usual, the psalm ends in praise and declarations of faith in these last seven verses that God will answer. Verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. It will please Yahweh better than an ox or a bull that has horns and hoofs. Comment, if we keep faith in God, it pleases him better than any sacrifice. What does he want with horns and hoofs? Verse 32. The humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek after God, let your heart live. For Yahweh hears the needy and doesn't despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves therein. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah. They shall settle there and own it. The children also of his servants shall inherit it. Those who love his name shall dwell therein. Comment, those who love his name will dwell with him for eternity. Psalm 70 is next.